Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the incredible achievements from the so-called light sailed mission, light sail 2 that is, and I also wanted to discuss why it's an incredible mission, but also why we'll never really be able to use this technology to sail the solar system. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. So this right here, the Light Sail 2, um, is basically a Kickstarter campaign to launch a very beautiful, very innovative satellite, uh, technically a CubeSat actually, a Cube satellite that's very standard in size, that's able to propel itself using the solar sails. And of course, as of today, the mission has been officially successfully completed, and it showed uh, that we can totally use the solar sails to navigate around the planet. It was even able to take a few shots of our planet and create quite a buzz in the scientific community. But I shouldn't really take the credit away from the first solar sail that was successfully tested. This was the Icarus project by the Japanese uh, JAXA, which is basically the equivalent of NASA in Japan. And they were really successful in using this to launch their craft to Venus. But this here was a crowdsource project and it involved a lot of independent researchers. So technically this is our achievement. Several thousand people participated in this and it was all thanks to them that this became possible. Now the schematics for this craft and all of the details are publicly available from the link in the description below. So technically you could make your own if you wanted to, although it wouldn't really be that easy. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it does have some really interesting um, achievements that have never been done before. So first of all, this is technically now the most efficient solar sail, able to propel itself much better than uh, the Japanese solar sail. Well, at the same time, um, it also has several control parts on the inside that make it quite unique. So for one, uh, when it comes to objects like this, you need to be able to control your orientation in space because, you know, it's a sail, it needs to sort of point at the sun in such a way that it gets the solar radiation. And because it has no propulsion on the inside and no engines whatsoever, it uses what's known as a reaction wheel that has a spinning object on the inside that basically constantly adjusts the momentum of the sail. So this is maybe not as easy to understand at first until you see it in action, but basically imagine if you were to take a CD player and place it in space, you could create first of all a stabilizer like you see right here on the screen, this is from um, the International Space Station, and at the same time you can also make objects spin around because if the CD spins one way, the actual object will spin the other way. So that's kind of how the sail is able to orient itself. But instead of using an actual moving spinning object, in Light Sail 2 they decided to go for a much more innovative technology using what's known as a magnetic torquer. And magnetic torquer works on a very similar principle, but instead of having a moving disc or a rotating disc, it uses something like this. There are only two tubes here at 90 degree angle, and they produce a magnetic field that can then use the power of Earth's magnetic field to literally orient itself without any moving parts. And the advantage of this technology is that because it has no moving parts, it doesn't break as often and it's a lot more reliable in general. Apart from the magnetic torquer, um, there is also a technology that prevents any rips in the sail. So for example, if a micrometeorite strikes the sail, it will still be fine because of the way it's been sewn together using what's known as mylar, which is this really cheap to produce and very reflective material that you see on the screen. And the way that all of this is sewn together using the so-called ripstop technique prevents it from totally ripping if something does hit the sail. In other words, it's going to be able to perform for a very long time. But I guess one of the questions you might be asking is, well, how exactly does this really work? Well, obviously it works through the interaction with the light. Not with the solar winds, not with any particles coming from the sun, but with the actual photons of light. When the light strikes the sail, it's reflected from it and that creates momentum. Now, technically, linear momentum requires some sort of mass, but we know that photons don't have any mass. So what's happening here? How can it possibly work? Well, this formula only applies to objects that are not moving at the speed of light. Once you start moving close to the speed of light, you have to use another formula. This formula relies on Einstein's E equals mc square. This will then give you the momentum um, calculations required to understand how these sails can actually function. 
Basically, it's a little bit more complicated than simple P equals MV. And so as of today, we know that this sail definitely works and it's able to increase the highest point of its orbit. Although unfortunately, the lowest point of the orbit has also been decreasing. Now, the explanation for this right now is that we still have trouble controlling the actual direction of the sail and so sometimes it's pointing at the sun in a different way thus causing the sail to also slightly drop in some parts of its orbit. So it's not a perfect solution just yet, we just need to find a way to control the sail better. But for now, according to the scientists, two thirds of the time we are able to control it really well, but one third of the time it's still sort of tumbling around and is not really controllable. And eventually the orbit here will drop so low that the atmospheric pressure will start influencing the sail to the point where it's just going to decrease its orbit and re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Nevertheless though, it's definitely a really cool achievement. I mean, the fact that it was launched on a Falcon Heavy rocket uh, achieved the altitude of roughly around 720 kilometers and is now able to perform really well just as expected is a huge achievement. Now, this is kind of what they expect to have, a very persistent increase in orbit over time, but we're not sure if we'll get there because we are having trouble controlling this right now. So only time will show where the sail will end up in the next year or so, but chances are that even though it will increase its orbit um, at the highest point, the lowest point will drop and eventually will force the sail to re-enter Earth. But anyway, so can we actually use this to travel the solar system? Well. Let's start with a simple calculation. Let's start with the idea of the sort of optimal acceleration, the maximum acceleration the sail can create if we were to position it perfectly against the sun. In this case, as you can see right here, the acceleration would be roughly around 0 0.058 millimeters per second square. Okay, that is really low. Just to give you an idea, at this perfect acceleration rate, assuming that nothing goes wrong, after about one month, we'll increase the speed of sail by about 550 kilometers per hour, or I think it's about 400 miles per hour. Or actually, no, 340 miles per hour. Now, after roughly around 16 months of being pushed by the sun in space, the speed can actually reach about 8,500 kilometers per hour, which is equivalent to about uh, 5,400 miles per hour. And this is actually the speed needed to escape uh, Moon's gravity well. But that's over a year of constant perfect acceleration that's very difficult to achieve right now. So let's just say, just as a kind of um, example here, if we wanted to take this to Mars, if we were to transfer from Earth's orbit to Mars orbit, can we actually achieve this and how long would it take? Now this is a very hypothetical scenario using perfect acceleration, perfect modeling, and assumptions that um, in reality would be much more difficult. But in order for us to transfer to Mars, we have to give ourselves a boost from Earth's orbit, specifically give our craft a lot more speed and initiate what's known as the Hochmann's orbital maneuver. I have a really old video somewhere up there explaining how this works. But basically, once we get this extra speed, it will give us a boost in orbit and uh, assuming we of course can do some extra maneuvering around, we'll then be able to reach Martian orbit in roughly around six months. Now let's just say we don't do these um, extra boosts because that will be impossible with a solar sail, and instead we'll try to get this speed right here needed for a direct transfer. That's not really how it works, but just for the sake of calculation, so let's try it. NASA created a very awesome website that allows you to calculate basically trajectories and distances and also time for the transfer maneuvers needed for pretty much every major object in the solar system. So we can use this website to calculate everything we need to know about a transfer to Mars from Earth, from uh, the so-called low Earth orbit. Although technically here would be in much higher orbit, but let's just ignore that for now. So if we click on search, it will show us that right here on August of 2020, actually basically a year from when I'm making this video, we have a perfect opportunity for transfer. It will require us to start firing our engine on August 3rd and we'll arrive at destination on February 27th, 2021 after about 208 days in space. The needed injection velocity or basically the needed boost velocity from Earth's orbit is around 3.87 kilometers per second. With some extra speed here for corrections, we'll ignore this for now. So we need to be able to achieve roughly around 3.9 kilometers per second of speed from Earth to then reach Mars. 
So in other words, if I were to give this Tesla Roadster an extra speed of about 3.9 kilometers per second right now, in a specific direction, it should technically reach Martian orbit. So that's kind of what we need to do. We need to be able to get that extra speed. Now, normally for objects like this, for example, for Tesla Roadster, we would use a rocket that would give it that extra boost after a few minutes, and it would then sort of slowly drift in space until it reaches Mars. But with the sail that we have, we can't do that because the acceleration is extremely low. So for this, we would need to stay in that region for a very long time trying to get that extra speed. And this is where it gets really tricky because it's just going to be impossible to achieve these velocities. To get 3.9 kilometers per second, in other words, to um, have Tesla Roadster here leave the orbit of Earth and then place it on the um, intersection orbit with Mars, we would need to wait a very, very long time. So if we do the calculations here, with this acceleration to reach roughly around 3.9 kilometers per second, we'd have to wait about 2.2 years, assuming everything is perfect, nothing has changed, and we're always somehow gaining the speed, which is impossible. The closer number would be several years, possibly a decade, of actual solar sail staying in orbit and always modifying the orbit. In other words, it would be practically impossible for a typical mission to Mars. Also, this is the biggest problem here, as you reach Mars, the um, amount of light here means that you only get about 43% of the sunlight here. In other words, the solar sail becomes a lot less effective. What used to be somewhat more effective on Earth will only have 43% here. So that acceleration will now dramatically drop. And the farther we move from the sun, the less effective these solar sails become. So basically, just like with the solar panels, by the time we reach planets like Jupiter, the um, actual effectiveness is only about 2% now, which means that they are become practically useless, which is why we're never going to be able to use solar sails to, quote, sail the solar system. It might be possible closer to the sun and we might be able to reach objects like Venus and Mercury using this technology, but right now the only major application for solar sails is not really sailing the solar system. What's been tested by the LightSail 2 project and what's been shown as definitely working is being able to control and change orbits of satellites in Earth's orbit. And this is why it's kind of important. Right now, the smaller satellites, the so-called CubeSats, are not able to control themselves. They can change the orientation using the technology I showed you previously, but they can't move around in orbit. But using solar sails, we now can technically have them move around orbits, change positions, and possibly even have them crash into Earth when they're expired and no longer needed so that we don't have to pollute the actual orbital space around the planet. And so the most important finding from the LightSail 2 mission is that we can now strap these really, really cheap Mylar um, additions to a typical CubeSat that can fit into any rocket, and then they'll be able to control their altitude without expansion of any fuel. Now, it's still in early stages of sort of implementation, and we still need to try to figure things out a little bit more, but we definitely know that it works, we definitely know that it's going to be really cheap to implement, and it will allow us to control satellites in Earth's orbit a lot more effectively and basically super, super cheap without using any fuel, which is why this mission is sort of brilliant. But don't expect to use solar sails to go sailing around the solar system. It's just not going to work. And anyway, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. I wanted to briefly explain to you why Light Sail Mission 2 is sort of important, but not for the reasons that most people think. On that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. And maybe even support this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out and as always, bye-bye.